It's really a pleasure to be here. It's quite an honor to uh, have the privilege of doing a dissertation that somebody might actually read. <laughs> so I've, I've got high hopes. And uh, the entire project that I'm going to talk about tonight, or one aspect of it that I'm a few aspects of it I'm going to talk about tonight um, are indebted to the people who initiated the policy, um, some of whom are in the room tonight, and others who volunteered their information to me anonymously, uh, anonymously as uh, research participants through the course of the study. So I'm completely dependent on, um, on the information that is available and that people are willing to share out in the world. So I want to acknowledge that up front, as well as all the assistance I've received on this project along the way. So, advancing. The buttons are not working for advancing. Why is it not frozen? Let's try the mouse. The mouse click worked. Okay. So tonight I'm going to try to provide some learning, some insights that come out of Berkeley's soft story ordinance, which was passed in 2005. And here's my summary of my talk in a nutshell. It was, I'm going to argue, a groundbreaking local earthquake policy experiment. And it had an unusual history and unusual features that we can learn from. I'm calling it a qualified success. And I'll talk to you about its implementation <clears throat> which was adequate given the resources which were extremely tight. I'm going to talk about its outcomes, which represent a modest and measurable degree of progress towards two very important sub public goals. And it achieved a reasonable benefit cost balance um, and has a high like, uh, is highly likely to be cost beneficial but there's a lot of uncertainty involved. So I actually invented at the end of my dissertation a, a new method, which I call the reasonableness assessment, for assessing policies which are in a gray area of cost effectiveness. But maybe we don't, we're not capable of precisely estimating their cost effectiveness, and maybe we don't want to, because they involve an issue of rights, health, or human safety where we're willing to tolerate some costs in excess of benefits in order to pursue our public aims. And so in, as part of that reasonableness assessment or presenting that, I'll kind of compare Berkeley's approach to the three other main um, policy options that have been tried for soft story programs, which range from purely voluntary programs to mandatory retrofits. So we have real world examples of all of those. How do they compare in terms of their reasonable, reasonableness? And what are the next steps in front of us immediately for policy development and technical knowledge advancement that are going to help these types of programs move forward? So that's my aim. So the previous mitigation policies in earthquakes are what set the stage for this ordinance. Um, and when I spoke with the 25 people who talked to me about how this law came about, uh, the story always came back to the 1986 Palo Alto Seismic Hazards Identification Program. Now, who here in this room has heard of that program? <laughs> Woo! A couple. So, despite it, it, it sort of happened just before the state URM law was passed, but it is, in fact, the first instance in California law of a mandatory evaluation program. So the city of Palo Alto, struggling with what to deal with, with how to deal with vulnerable existing buildings, decided to create a community council and asked that council to come back with them on recommendations about how to tackle the issue. And they came up with a list and they came up with prioritization criteria. Um, this is fully, you know, 20 years before CAPS was really doing the same thing, type of thing. And the idea they came up with, which was then implemented was a mandatory evaluation ordinance that affected a high tier risk group of 39 buildings. But they didn't have to retrofit the property. They just had to pay an engineer to analyze it. And that's the first instance in California law of this type of thing. Later that year, the California state URM law was passed and cities and jurisdictions all around the state were asked to come up with their own strategies for tackling their inventories of URM buildings. Now, down the line, Loma Prieta occurs, rocks the Bay Area, 
tremendous opportunity for learning for professionals in building fields and a source of inspiration that lasted for decades. The city of Berkeley responded to that law with a suite of uh, policy initiatives, including a transfer tax rebate program, which is eligible for single family and smaller homes, smaller residential properties. They initiated their URM law. Arietta Chacos and others um, marshaled their own resources to get the Berkeley Unified School District to focus on vulnerable schools. So this was a very active period for Berkeley policy, capped off by Northridge and then Kobe, which reminded people that serious disaster effects can be had even in places with very advanced seismic codes. In response to that, the building official, Reggie Meigs, at the time, um, hired Jim Russell, who was one of the instigators of Palo Alto's ordinance, to do an inventory in the city of Berkeley. He had been, Reggie Meigs had been driving around and he said, I see Northridge everywhere. This is not going to stand on my watch. I want to do something about it. He squeezed probably $75,000 out of some cost savings out of his department and, and paid for a consultant to come in and train another city employee. And together they found 400 um, pre-1997 suspected soft story residential structures with more than five units. Now, the city then got very distracted. Reggie Miggs left the job for totally unrelated reasons. And the city was working on updating its public buildings, the UC Berkeley was doing a major disaster resistant universities initiative. Um, the city hired on the science technical advisory group consultants. Many are famous people who Tom Tobin, others from the university um, to offer them advice on where they should be going with their seismic initiatives. And then Berkeley was also a project impact city for FEMA. So there lots was going on. But that list was in a drawer for about four or five years until Joan McQuarrie comes in and Dan Lambert was tasked and mo moved over in, in the department and tasked to manage URM programs. And according to Joan, Arietta comes kind of running in the room and says, we've got this list, we've got to do something with this. And it took another two years to figure out um, a strategy and to find the resources to put the effort into it. Um, but when they did tackle the issue, the first thing they did was go back and look at the inventory and try and validate it and demonstrate that there was real risk um, on this list of prop properties that had been sitting there for so long. So they did that in two ways. They hired some student university interns um, and did a follow-up study, a walkabout, with volunteers from EERI who participated in that. Anybody in this room? Great, thank you so much. Um, and students participated as well, but they were all paired with a practicing professional. Later on, the owners were convinced that only students had walked around the city and that this law had been perpetrated upon them using, you know, undergraduate logic. And uh, an, an interesting example of how getting the wrong story out can undermine your policy credibility telling the story of the credibility of the development of this list would have been very helpful later on. Um, as the idea went forward, people were talking about a mandatory retrofit ordinance in Berkeley, and there was considerable momentum behind that idea. But the feeling was there, and I think all of us intuitively sense it when we talk about mandatory retrofit, it feels a bit unfair to make owners who purchased a property 30 years ago with the assumption that it was going to be safe uh, to make them pay for a retrofit, um, mandated retrofit, without any public assistance. There's just some, it doesn't sit well with people. And it didn't, so the idea came forward to raise a transfer, a new transfer tax and to put some of those funds into, uh, make, make them accessible to owners who would be affected by a mandated re retrofit ordinance and, and who couldn't afford it. Well, that bond ballot measure failed. And unfortunately, it was like the only thing to fail in Berkeley for a long time, but that one failed. So the idea started to shift to a mandatory evaluation 
followed by mandatory retrofit later. So the, the concept became a two-phased program. And that immediately had a lot of logical appeal because the mandatory evaluation phase would get you so many steps farther to justifying and demonstrating the feasibility of a mandatory retrofit phase. So it was a natural sequence, a natural progression, and also a lot less costly for the owners on the first run. You might weed out all the buildings that don't really need to be retrofit and then target your mandatory retrofit ordinance at a much, potentially much smaller group of buildings. So that was the policy concept as of then. And it was basically a fait accompli by the time that a community meeting was held in 2005, hosted by the mayor, that the city council would pass an ordinance of that to that effect, and it did so later that year. Now, when you're in, in my field, when you come in to evaluate a program, the first thing you should do is actually draw a conceptual diagram or spell out the logic of how the program is supposed to work. And we call these pro pro program logic models. And I will now introduce to you this elaborate beast. Um, Joan, this is probably the first time you've even seen it. Um, this may not be what you, this is my attempt to put in a diagram what you guys had in your head. So that's, that's what it's meant to represent. So first, there's long-term goals and policy motivations. These are the underlying justifications. And the city was trying to pursue social net benefit by balancing potential benefits of the program, things like increased safety, increased housing stock quality and resilience, less need for city services during and after a disaster, and policy experimentation and spread, which are in themselves public benefit, with the potential costs, which include mostly costs to the city, in this case program management, and to owners in the form of their engineering costs and other expenses. And these ideas are operationalized through development policy steps and they involve the inventory, passing the law, which had a large number of provisions, and I'll come back and talk about each one of those in a minute, and then you implement the program with key activities. So once the law is out there, things change as you find out what you need to do in the real world. Then the policy what had kind of what it has called what you could call near-term goals. And I found two of those through my research. The first was to promote a market climate for voluntary retrofits. So even though this was a, an evaluation ordinance, the idea was to throw as much in it to change, change the game in terms of how owners are thinking about it. So we're going to increase awareness of all the stakeholders who, who are involved. We're going to mandate tenant notifications. We're going to put signs on the building so that visitors see it. We're going to put a notice on the deed. We're going to put a public website with the list of your compliance status and your retrofit, retrofit status. We're also going to increase the costs of action. So we're going to... Um, make you do these tenant notifications in perpetuity until you get a retrofit. So you've got a nuisance now that you have to tell your property manager to do um, month in, month out. We're also going to accomplish first, force you to accomplish the first steps of doing a retrofit. So you're going to have to meet an engineer, you're going to have to have him evaluate your building, and you're going to have an evaluation schema a, a retrofit schema in front of you. So now you can no longer pretend that you don't know approximately how much it would cost and how much benefit it would bring you to do the retrofit. So that's bringing someone several major steps down the road. And finally, you're also going to, that the laws also intended to increase the benefits of taking the action that you want them to take. So it had a couple of little, um, little cost savings for for the owner in it. Um, one was was to waive the report filing fee if you were doing a concurrent retrofit. And another benefit, which actually was attractive to a lot of owners, was a 15-year exemption from future retrofit mandates. And that gave them some security. If I retrofit now, according to the rules you're imposing on me now, 
you won't be able to impose more strict rules on me in the near future. I have some protection from that. So that was goal number one. Goal number two was to, again, what I was saying before, promote the mandatory retrofit ordinance. So here we have the goals that relate to collecting information that will bolster the technical justification, help us understand what the implications are, um, help us really cost out and plan for a mandatory ordinance. And we're also going to build internal political support and, and, and capacity. So we're going to be ready to roll on a, on a mandatory ordinance. So the benefit, completed soft story retrofits, that's what you hope happens in the meantime. But as Joan and others told me, they weren't sure that any volunteer retrofits were going to happen. It came as a complete surprise how many owners wanted to do voluntary retrofits when this law, right after this law was imposed on them. So there was no assurance that any action would happen in this little black box in the corner. And they even had less assurance, but I found evidence in my interviews, of retrofits that were not soft story retrofits, but you got an owner sensitized. And they ended up retrofitting a building in Oakland that they owned that was soft story, or they ended up thinking differently about their home or another aspect of their business that related to emergency preparedness. So there was a little side benefit there that was unanticipated. And then those things are what fuel the long-term goals, your progress towards the long-term goals at the end. That is, we also call these spaghetti diagrams sometimes. Um, so again, just running through the mandatory evaluation approach that Berkeley took, you've got the notice on the title immediately. To get it off, you have to file your report showing that you're not soft story or not eligible for some other reason or retrofit, otherwise it's on there in perpetuity. Banks will see it, potential buyers will see it. You're on a public list on a website. You have to do your evaluation report within two years. The city has the right to review it until it finds it acceptable. Um, the typical engineering cost for doing one of these reports was around $4,000. Uh, they ranged from two to maybe six or seven. And for a concurrent retrofit, it could be more like ten dollars to $15,000 for total engineering costs per project. Um, the city requested enough information in that analysis that um, destructive testing and investigation was often required. About um, half of the of a subsample of uh, reports for which I was able to look at that had to do some destructive testing. And here's an example of a building on Dwight Street, which still looks like this. <laughs> yeah, it's been about four years looking like that. So that's a bit of blight. <laughs> That's not so lovely. Um, the report also had to include a retrofit schema. As I said, not a full plan, but at least some kind of viable schema. You had to notify the tenants in writing, uh, post signage on the building, talk about the incentives. Oh, there was also a penalty. So the city reserved the right to fine you up to $5,000 per incident and $10,000 if an injury results under its general nuisance provisions of the, on the planning code. Um, but no fines have been used so far. I think this is uh, one of the key areas where we could raise some effectiveness of the law. And I'll come back to that at the end. Um, finally, it was very important, actually, to a lot of owners I spoke with, this credible threat of a second mandatory phase. So the city was very vocal in all its public communications that this was phase one and down the pipe we are planning on imposing a mandatory retrofit ordinance and in Berkeley that was believable. That might not be true in a lot of places and the city ran into difficulties such as the economic downturn and that mandatory retrofit phase has not yet come into being. But it is not a dead issue. There's active discussion. And in fact, I've been on the phone with several people this week that things seem to be gaining a little bit of momentum. So um, something still could be in front of the council this year. Here's an example of the warning sign and what it says and its location on a building, you know, kind of above the mailboxes. It's a little eight and a half by 11 -y kind of thing and modeled after the URM wording. Um, and that's the back of the building that it's on. 
<coughs> give you a little example. Any, any questions so far about the law? Anything interest you? Yeah. So the costs are all <coughs> owners, right? But what if owners can't afford, you know, four thousand dollars for engineering fees? Yeah. Was that? I mean, did you find that to be an issue in places? Well, there are um, about eight percent of owners who have yet to file their report. So you might imagine that people who are having trouble affording it uh, would be in that group. And I didn't was not able to interview any people in that group. I couldn't get them to talk to me. So I don't know why they're not complying. Um, other than that, I would say that for most of these buildings, their annual, I mean, their, their monthly kind of opera, operating budget, they're bringing in um, about $20,000 a month in rent. So I'm not buying that they can't afford 4000 for a study. You, you've got to be mismanaging your business pretty bad if you don't have that much savings in your uh, reserve fund. Yeah. Did you have any, in terms of your educational program, did you have any um, figures that you could give owners in terms of the, the type of damage they could expect uh, following an earthquake, like a PML or a, you know, estimated mm. percentage mm. of replacement cost? Mm. So I have no educational program. What the law was counting on was the well, engineering the was was the engine was the engineer producing the report and I would say c communicating that type of okay. advice to them verbally if not in their analysis so up no a PML was not a required element in the framework they were just supposed to move through that international existing building codes appendix a for chapter A4 analysis instructions and provide that to the city. Um, and the written report that went along with it was supposed to, you know, make a verdict. This building meets the soft story criteria or not. Um, the owners I spoke with, by and large, said nobody, I did not read it. Mm -hmm. I did not read it. So I think my qualitative evidence is that the verbal communication and the judgment ex expressed by the engineer is far more persuasive than what they write because what they write may never even really be looked at by the owner yeah i'm interested in whether or not safety or <coughs> um, was the big issue or if the, some um, consideration of their investment and loss of investment or was it a little bit of both yeah you know? i I would love to study the communications between engineers and owners in an observational way because that is a very curious thing. What? Do, how do people talk about it? What does the owner hear when they go away from it? What do they remember two weeks later? Um, I, I, I don't know really what happened in those relationships and I'm, I'm intrigued based on the powerful position that I see them in. And, engineers are in, in terms of delivering the public benefit from this type of law, you're totally dependent on it. I can tell you As one of them in the room. Yeah. My anecdotal experience <laughs> in talking to between five and ten building owners, yeah. uh, which side we yeah. had probably seven or eight minutes, that uh, the city led that course to the trough, but I, as an engineer you're describing, yes. could not get them to drink. They were fully uninterested in any conversations about risk, recognition of the proximity of the fault, behavior of this class of building in yeah. Bridge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They just wanted out. Yeah. And oftentimes, I had to let go of the commission because the $4,000 fee, uh, in my experience, was even stiff. I mean, if, if an engineer bills at $100 an hour, yeah. that's an yeah. arithmetic. It's, it's not a lot of time. Yeah. Almost without exception, no original drawings are available. So you have yeah. to go to the site. Yeah. And, and you have to spend time instructing people how to demolish this or that structurally to ascertain. So, so they, they were not interested in asset protection or anything other than just getting out to what yeah. they perceived was. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I think those that would. Would you agree that those that were interested in asset protection? I never met that person. You never <laughs> met that person. Those might be retrofitters. 
Yeah. Those might be the 20% who, who go to the retrofit, um, and they are a, sub, a small subset. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so among the key implementation activities and decisions that had to be made, I'm going to run you through four of those right now. So the notifications went out to 317 owners. About 70 concrete tilt-up or podium buildings were excluded. So there was a technical issue. Do we know enough to, ev do we have clear enough procedures to evaluate those buildings that are of a slightly different construction makeup? and offer them, and, and, and do we have the criteria available to help them plan their retrofits and, and to say what they should do. Uh, they just didn't fit within IEBC A4. So, and there wasn't another available criteria, so they said, let's shelve that issue to another date. And there it remains on the shelf. Um, in terms of the choice of technical standards, codes, and guidance, again, we have IEBC a4, they reference the 2003 version in the original law, but it obviously it gets upgraded every six years and many improvements have been made since then. The very first owners who complied were stuck with the first out edition of this code, which had many difficult, confusing elements, caused a lot of problems for people. The framework was their evaluation guidance document and one of my strong recommendations from uh, my st overall study is that engineers have to have that kind of guidance and the more detailed the better. Um, the engineers I spoke to and now I'm adding another data point today so you can give us our, your opinion um, said give us exact template example evaluations for a couple of building prototypes and your average report quality will improve dramatically and that was just not available at the beginning so you ended up having some engineers who developed a little boutique business and did two, three, four, five, ten, and then had their own templates and were able to produce reports of better quality more quickly. And I would say the better report providers probably charged more on the six to eight thousand dollar range, and there were a lot of twos that had pretty poor quality reports. So you had bifurcation in the quality of reports and consolidation of the number of engineers doing reports over time as the ordinance moved forward as people kind of specialized and figured out this is something I want to do I don't want to do. Um, so 52 engineers attended the city training. In total, I think I measured about 66 en different engineers did reports. So out of the 200 or so reports that had been filed, I guess, um, somebody did 28 of them. <laughs> You know, a couple other people did 10 each, and then there's a lot of ones. If any is interested more in the engineering practice or a response to this law, we can talk about it. Um, the report review process is another essential activity that you have to set up. Um, the city decided right away to uh, outsource the plan check and review of the reports to a, a traditional plan check company. And it started out with LP2A, which was then bought out by Bureau Veritas. And then people, key staff at Bureau Veritas who have the essential skills, defected, started their own new company, and eventually the city contract moved to the third company. What all that means is that city contracting rules tend to impede the efficiency of this kind of program implementation because uh, along the way these hiccups meant that different people were reviewing reports, contracts had to be changed, consistency could not be maintained. So that is something that I think other cities should look at in the future. I'd be curious about your thoughts on that. And at first the concurrent retrofits really did catch them off guard so they didn't have a plan in place about how to merge the report review process with the plan review process. And I think that caused a lot of frustration because the owners were like, hey, I'm ready to do this. Why don't you guys have it figured out so that it's easy? You know, they were very surprised that the city wasn't ready and someone taken it back. So there was a real a learning curve at the beginning for everyone involved. 
And then finally, the program had a lot of administration, and it, it cannot be underestimated that this kind of program just takes a person to run. You cannot get by having tiny little parts of the program run by different people in the office. So it was really great that for the first five years, the city was able to have a dedicated staff person who had some technical awareness, who had a lot of political savvy inside the city, was able to get the information flow going between the plan checkers, the owners, the engineers, and all the other city uh, departments that were involved. And it was really a full-time job for him for five years, and then budget ran out. Um, so things are now really on quite a maintenance level, but I would argue that that was even bare minimum. And um, it's just not worth doing this kind of policy unless you can have at least that much staff available. And for that long of time, even though the timeline was only two years for that initial report, it really took them five years to get 80% of the reports in. So you're looking more at like a URM scale of timeline in terms of running this kind of program. It's not going to be an in and out kind of engagement. And it would really be unfair even to the owners if you did it that way. So um, those are some considerations for other cities looking at this. So here's, a, here's just a little bit of data on that report compliance over time. Um, as you see over these years that I was watching the program, more and more people are getting their reports in. A very interesting little, couple of interesting little sidebars here. So one, you see the blue reports in review. Well, they're kind of staying there. There's a group of reports that's not necessarily the same report sitting there for three years, but there are a lot of reports who are sitting open for a really long time. And I found interestingly in my interviews with some engineers and owners that it was a disagreement with over fees. So an engineer had submitted a report the city came back and said, you need to do revisions. They went back to the owner. Engineer goes to the owner and says, I, I need more money to complete these changes. And the owner says, why are you nickel and diming me? You told me you could complete an approved report on the first round. I'm not paying. And then the report sits in a, in a little game of chicken between the owner and the engineer. So there is a little bit of that going on. Um, eventually, over time, the request for removals got cleaned out. Um, embarrassed, somewhat embarrassingly, um, there were about 10% of the units that were just administratively mislabeled. So this law only applies to residential units, five plus, and there were errors in that um, database. So people had to you know, had to file paperwork to say, I'm, I'm a motel, I'm not subject to this ordinance, or I have a commercial unit on the first floor and then four units above. Um, they're, they're technically not falling under this law. That says nothing about whether or not they have a soft story condition, right? Um, but those guys came off the list. Um, there is that purple band, which represents kind of the error of I mistakenly identifying a soft property, a soft a story conditions, and those, those guys were the most mad and the most eager to talk to me. <laughs> um, the bar was set pretty high in terms of the burden of proof for getting off the list. Proving you are not soft means you have to do an evaluation study that shows all those calculations. That could cost you as much as someone's report to say that they are soft. And the city said, we're going to hold you to that. So only in a few rare cases was that a slam dunk, quick calculation. And uh, those, those guys were really ticked off about, about their engineering fees. Of course, the most interesting group down at the bottom the building permits and the cleared because of retrofit post law. So by 2011, we're up to almost 25% of the initially noticed properties. And if you take out the ones that were mistakenly notified, you're almost at 30% of the validly soft story notified properties who have initiated a retrofit. That's a remarkable number, considering the spontaneous background rate of this behavior is well under half of a percent. 
So how does this law create this effect? I'm not going to talk about this a lot tonight, but I did put in two slides because this is the, the real interesting stuff about human decision making. My theory going into this study was that four interrelated factors influence precautionary decision making, and we tend to neglect two of them, and we're doing that at our great, great um, cost. So traditionally, we talk about the threat. What's, what's coming at you? What's the hazard? What's our scientific understanding of it? What's the probability, the consequence types? the likelihood, the severity, the imminence, all these kinds of things. Very important to understand and have our facts straight about. But is it really going to get you to that belief and behavior change? Sometimes. We also talk about the recommended action. This is where you get into the technical details. What, what, it, what remedies are available for the problem that you're talking to me about? Am I capable of carrying them out? Um, how effective are they? How long do they take to work? Um, are they going to be obsolete in five years? A lot of considerations relevant here on the recommended action. And that's kind of the traditional risk communication paradigm. You're talking to people about why to do it and what to do. But a very limited set of reasons why to do something. In the study of criminal justice, uh, you know, they talk a lot about deterrence and things like that. but what, what they really realized is most people obey the law because they want to. It's for positive reasons, not because of the threat of incarceration. It's because I get a lot of benefit out of seeing myself as a law-abiding, conscientious individual. And that is the bulk of compliance with laws in our country. So applying that same kind of logic, what is the social setting? Tell me about, how, to, about what, how I should behave. And in fact, my physical environment tells me very little about how to behave about this risk. Very little. I get a signal every 140 years. <laughs> so my social setting is telling me, don't worry about it. And I'm likely, very likely, human beings are very likely to substitute the judgment of their community, their peers, their like individuals for their own judgment when when real decision input is not available. V real visceral decision input is not available. So on this other side, we have the individual. So their values, emotions, resources, personal history, personality, and even physiology, those interact with the threat, right? The threat has to be personally relevant to them and impact things that they care about. And then we have the social setting, which is the housing market. The laws that we have, um, our sense of duty, what should I ought to do, um, how visible is the behavior. One of the darndest things about earthquake mitigation is it's totally invisible. Once you put all the plaster back up on the wall, no one can tell. It's just your word against mine that this is a retrofit building unless you have some kind of documentation. It's just not that easy to see. So those are some of the interesting things I wanted to bring out in this study when I went to talk to to owners. So if we find, and I hope you'll agree that, the, that this law successfully promoted a voluntary climate for retrofits, it was because it triggered all four of these things in mutually reinforcing ways. So you have owners who are now more informed and potential buyers who are more informed. And they're specifically aware about these properties. So I found in this audience that they had a high degree of awareness of earthquake risk in general, and even of soft story buildings. But they weren't very conscious that they owned a soft story building. There's a bit of denial going on there. <clears throat> and certainly a potential buyer wasn't thinking, this, thinking about it either. Um, remarkably low level of thinking about earthquakes happening in the moment when people are purchasing properties. And that is a, a, an enormous problem that we need to confront. People come to this decision at moments when it makes sense, and that's when they're doing major capital upgrades and are doing other work on the property or when they're making purchase decisions. But not only did it inform owners and potential buyers, um, by the way, it informed tenants too, but that part of the law was not very powerful, and we can talk about that more if you want. 
<coughs> it enabled owners by forcing them to take the first steps. Now they know an engineer. Now they know how much it's going to cost, or his ballpark estimate of how much it's going to cost. Um, they are so much more capable of carrying out the action should they have the intention to do it, um, that barriers to action have been greatly reduced. They're also burdened because they've got salient near-term costs added to the choice of not retrofitting now. And chief among those, by the way, is devalue a sense of devaluation of the property. And that comes from the stigmatized social setting. So this law effectively reversed the social norm about mitigation in this community. All the soft story owners that I spoke with now believe that it's better to have a retrofit building than not. And they own know someone who owns and has retrofitted a property. 70% of them now own, know someone who has retrofit a rental property. So they now lo no longer think of this behavior as a sucker's game. They now think of it as the ideal that I wish I could attain. And a lot of the people who didn't retrofit feel that way too. So even though they didn't carry out the action, they wish they could. And that is where we want to be as a society. So what about the buildings? Um, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about those and what was found in the evaluation reports. Um, there is a companion study conducted, led by David Bonowitz, and I'm, I'm sorry he couldn't be here tonight, but he's going to be presenting some of his findings at later EERI meetings, so keep aware of um, that, and the study should be out after its review sometime this summer. So we kind of found that the buildings roughly fall into two types by age, height, and material. There's sort of a cluster of older buildings that tend to be taller and uh, do not really have any wood structure paneling kind of products in them. And then there's the modern, more modern <laughs> 1950s and 60s buildings. That's the bulk of the buildings really. Um, that either are short and don't have wood structure paneling or they're a little bit taller and they have wood structure paneling. Um, David tells me, and I'm no, nowhere in the position to judge, that that might have some meaning for our understanding of the degree of hazard there or the cost of the remedy and that and, and like kinds of assumptions. You'll also see that the law mistakenly notified five buildings that are one-story buildings. And that's also a little, little, little bit of a boo-boo. But the overall picture from this look at the buildings is that there's a large diversity of structures among those that can be labeled as soft, weak, or open front. That's probably not a surprise to anybody in this room, but it's a real problem for policymaking because how do you justify treating a certain class of people differently than others? How much diversity can you accept in that group before the justification to treat them differently disappears, okay? We face that problem in all kinds of policy domains, um, welfare, public health. Um, you have to make these decisions about who gets the special treatment. You know, if you're going in for a mammogram, how much risk has to be in the group before you think that it's worth exposing yourself to a different kind of risk in order to detect the harm? Difficult trade-offs have to be made, and we tried to struggle, wrestle with some of that in, in our discussions in the EERI um, Special Projects Report. Two other things we found there of interest. Um, we found inconsistent quality assumptions in, and analysis in the engineering reports. So among those that we were able to review, and it's definitely a smaller subset between 40 or 80 of the approved reports, depending on the question we were asking. Um, we, we, we need to do more to communicate to the engineers about, to the practicing engineer about um, what we want the evaluation to contain in it. And um, that's not just about communication, it's also about the review process and, we, and, and helping the owner choose an engineer who's likely to produce for them a, a highly useful, high quality report. So 
one of my recommendations is actually to, to think about very seriously how to facilitate communication between owners about engineering, ex engineer their experience with their service provider and how well it worked. Um, there's some obstacles there, but worth thinking about for sure, from a professional practice point of view, and also policing, internal policing of the quality of the work among engineers is another possible angle. Finally, misleading visual indicators. David took a subset of the buildings, reanalyzed them according to what he believes is the best kind of consistent methodology he would use and found that there was not a good correlation between traditional indicators of collapse hazard and the visual indicators that were used to make the inventory for the law initially. So that's another real big problem. It begs the question, are we missing a lot of buildings that should be on the list? And how can we get rid of this problem of listing buildings that shouldn't be listed? Are we just not, um, we're trusting the wrong signals. So in, in a way, soft story looks like low hanging fruit because it's so easy to spot and it just looks weak. Those little stilts just don't look right. So it's easy for policymakers and the public to buy your story. But if that, in fact, is not the story of what makes a building weak, um, we have more work to do to understand that and then communicate that to the people who are backing the policies. Now, what about the retrofits? Um, there were 76 post-law retrofits completed as of last summer. And I don't see a lot of movement now. I think the, that benefit is petered out. Um, I, in fact, talked to a couple of owners who specifically said, I'm holding my building permit. I'm not going to follow through. But these are actual completes. And they affected about 1,000 units. So that if you figure that average occupancy is 1.8 to 2.2 people per unit, that's 2,000 people who now live in a retrofit building who didn't before. And that's 5% of Berkeley's multifamily housing stock entirely. So that's not an unmeasurable improvement in, in community public safety. Now, no analyses have been done yet of the hazard that those buildings represented and now don't represent, the scope of the retrofits that have been attempted, or how well they were executed. Um, but I would love to see some work on that. That, that could be something potentially that people in this room could help with. Now, cost is another thing that people always want to know about, and I collected what data about it I could. I divide that into pre-law retrofits and post-law retrofits just to see if there might be any differences. You might imagine that it, that could go either way, right? You might have a more, a more uh, involved retrofit plan after the law or before the law. I could imagine it going either way, but it turns out they're not really that different. Um, data was really hard to come by on this, surprising. I, I don't understand why city planning departments don't record whether the work that's being done is pursuant to seismic safety when they pass a building permit. Because when the big one happens, and it will, we all know, we're going to want to know whether what we did worked. And we have no idea where are all the projects that we've worked on. No systematic way to go back and check the performance of those events. That's just a massive learning system error in our. To those buildings, yeah. So oh, Berkeley's got it. it. Berkeley's oh, Berkeley's got cities. it. No. Sorry, <laughs> I was overgeneralizing. This is, to my knowledge, the first systematic list of retrofits of a similar type completed ever. Uh, there was an, an interesting um, website created a couple years ago. David was involved in that, trying to get people to geocode their retrofit projects and collect some data and, and visuals. That's the only other attempt I know of in that direction. Yeah, that's up on the ER website. Love that. I want to see every practicing engineer doing that with all their projects. But talk about opening yourself up to a little professional scrutiny. There's some issues there. Um, but getting back to the costs. So these are reported permit valuations. And we all know those are underestimated. 
So I'll, I'll tell you in a moment how much I think they're underestimated by, but um, the, there weren't any big differences in pre versus post law retrofits on a per unit valuation basis. And that's, that's a lot less expensive than most people kind of think these retrofits are. So I, I kind of only got very fuzzy qualitative information about this, but I, I, I pegged out eight owners, eight projects about which I was able to get owners and engineers to discuss costs and level of detail that I felt was giving some kind of real project cost. And that was about, th those were about 200 to 400% of the valuation. So if you figure the valuation is usually one quarter to, to one half of what the real project cost is. You just, so you double or quadruple the per unit valuation and, and you'll have a more realistic, like real world kind of cost. Um, so that would put it at closer to um, eight, eight to 12 per unit. Um, yeah. And the engineering costs, I think I said this earlier, per retrofit were around that. In case you want to know how much you can make working on these projects. And that's outside of the 8 to 12 per unit? Or is that included in the 8 to 12,000 per unit? That is included in that, in that total project cost, some of which would be engineering, labor, materials, tenant, um, tenant disruption pay payments. That was an interesting cost I hadn't thought about. Tenants want to be reimbursed for their uh, the noise and the dust and the parking hassles and their relocation during these retrofits. And owners were really surprised and ticked off at how um, greedy tenants, I mean, they perceived it as greedy, you know, whatever, however you want to view that. I actually didn't didn't because there there are some commercial mixed use in this group it is very small it's only 10% of the total and those projects tend to be really expensive and are not getting done I talked to one building 12 unit building two commercial units on the bottom with 10 on top it's also a historic building their retrofit estimate was four hundred thousand dollars because of ADA, historical, tenant relocation, lost leasing of the commercial units for six months while they're doing it. I mean, it was an enormous bill. He's, he just said, that's crazy. Don't tell me that's cost How's beneficial. So there's no hardship? I, mean, I think there's a hardship with no, ADA. It's just no. like the URM law. Yeah. Attorney General years ago issued a statement that said, <coughs> you know, there's a retrofitting a URM unless do the Accessibility upgrades as well. So, no, no exception. Okay. So, trig yeah, triggers were an issue. The one that raised the ire of tenants, I mean, the owners I talked with the most was actually um, not waiving parking. So, if you can imagine, these are parking openings for the most part. If the city is willing to lose three parking spaces, a lot of the owners could have done a very inexpensive retrofit. And they said, hey, what's your priority here, guys? Life safety or the parking? Because I'm happy to retrofit and keep the building from collapsing but give up the units. And I lose money on the monthly parking that I'm not getting anymore. Like it's a, you know, a fair lose-lose for everybody. But no, no go. Um, that was just a judgment about the priorities. And it could be different. It could be changed even. But it might be how we want to go. It's just a, a, something for debate. Okay, final verdict on the policy's second goal, advancing long-term policy objectives and, and sort of promotion of a mandatory rich fit ordinance. Well, it collected a tremendous amount of valuable information. This is really an unprecedented amount of data about buildings. Um, but there really wasn't a plan much less resources for how to analyze those data. And I'm glad I stumbled into the case. I hope I've been able to do some help on that. 
David and I, through the help of EERI, are going to try and follow through on some of these technical questions that could be asked of that data set, but we've only been able to look at a very small subset of the reports. Um, there's, there's even more benefit to be gained there, and, the, and the, the city's not really in a position to um, follow through on that. Secondly, it, it set a tremendous policy precedent um, that spread. So the city of Alameda passed a law in 2009. The city of Oakland passed a mandatory screening ordinance in 2010. Um, the city of San Francisco is pushing ahead. The city of Richmond did an inventory. Um, there is a lot of action, and the city of Berkeley contributed to it. That is a public benefit. Um, but the law has now... It, now that you've played the policy out, now you know it's a really expensive kind of policy, a slow one to bring benefits, and other cities see that. So you get some cities taking action that wouldn't have otherwise, but you get some that might have that won't because they see now, I better not go that direction. It's too, it's beyond me. It's too, too technically complicated. Two other points. The law was successful enough in its voluntary retrofit motivating to decrease the sense of urgency about passing a mandatory retrofit. And we've already captured all the low-hanging fruits, and so now the retrofits that are left are the more resistant owners, maybe potentially the more difficult projects. Um, so one, one wonders about that. And then all these technical insights, to the extent that you're able to analyze that data, they might weaken the case for a mandatory retrofit ordinance, Few, giving owners who are resistant to the idea fuel to say you don't really understand the problem well enough to pinpoint an inventory that really deserves to be treated differently and you don't know what to tell us to do to make them a measurable increment safer or maybe that incremental increase in safety is is not worth what we're going to be spending you get you're giving them more data means more data for everybody including your critics all right, now I, I tried at the end of my dissertation to make some type of cost-benefit analysis for this law. And please bear with me through a couple of really detailed tables. We'll walk through them slowly, and they contain, this is what we call back the envelope in my business. Um, really rough cost estimates, but it gives you something to think about in terms of magnitudes. So if, if we assume kind of like the CAPS technical appendices suggest that about 20% of soft story buildings might be subject to collapse or be totally unusable after a major Bay Area event, then you're looking at about 10 buildings that are now not going to experience that because of the 76 retrofits that have occurred. So there's a lot of benefits from that, like debris you don't have to clear, blight that your neighborhoods don't experience, but they're kind of small and I didn't really know how to estimate them, so they're just kind of sitting there. And I talked earlier about the 2,000 tenants who are living in these retrofit units. If you imagine that 20% again of those buildings are they're unable to return to their unit, you've got 250 people who don't need emergency service shelter, that don't need medical treatment, that don't need rescue right after the event. That's a real public benefit when the earthquake happens. Didn't know how to estimate it, just put it out there. If I can convince you that this policy will save one statistical life, so out of those 76 retrofits, somebody's not going to die because they've been done. And that has a point. 6-3 chance of happening in the next 30 years. Then if you put a value on life, which the US EPA um, has extensive methods for doing, uh, it's, it's 7.6 million per, per statistical life saved. That is a, a standard methodology for evaluating <laughs> risk reduction programs in health and environment field. Um, then 4.8 million is the expected benefit from that benefit alone. The private losses avoided are something on the order of 14 million if you ex assume, and now listen to this assumption because I hope you'll find it very conservative, that 20% of the retrofit buildings 
experience a 50% reduction in loss from total loss to half loss. So a $3 million building, $3 million replacement cost is now damaged only 1.5 million. And that's only 20% of those buildings. Right. So did 14 David, million. Did David do any work on this in terms of habitability? What a reduction of 50% means in terms of displaced? No. 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 So tons of assumptions here. This is very, right. very just throwing something out there for us to talk about magnitudes and stuff. This is like literally I'd hot off the press. I did this last week. So it's still got to be vetted, I would say. But I wanted to introduce some of these things. Now let's look at the cost side. Report filing fee. Paid straight through to the reviewer. No, the city got not a dime extra on the report filing fee. That was very generous of you guys. Um, the report fees paid to the engineer, estimating 203 approved reports at $4,000. That's $800,000. Um, program management, half a million, service contracts, signage inspection, inspection research, um, roughly 1.6 million into those kinds of things. And then using the cost estimates to, for the owner, I kind of use the low end or the high end estimate, mm -hmm. and you get total costs of around between five and 10 million, depending on whether you use those. So. The little tiny, like, bottom line footprint here is with 19 million in benefits, the benefits appear to outweigh the cost. And on, you know, a several, uh, several fold kind of level. So that's what I got for benefit costs. I'm not happy with that. That's not a detailed, comprehensive, including all kinds of earthquakes and the sophisticated kind of probabilities we would like to be doing, but short of walking through each one of those retrofits and the building before and the building after, and it takes just a manpower effort that I, no one, there's no one there to pay me to do it right now. I have another job starting August 1. Um, that's where we're at. So I was unsatisfied with that and came up with the idea of a reasonableness analysis. And then I wanted to apply that to the spectrum of coercion that you can use on this issue. So this is the state of policy right now here in the Bay Area. Who's got what kind of program? Santa Clara County has a list and is not doing anything with it. That's why they're the arrow going this way. And San Francisco has an arrow going the other way because they're kind of, they have a list and they're thinking about going all the way. And you notice all programs begin from an inventory. That's our mode of working on this kind of policy right now. If you can think of another way to do it, great. But that is, you're stuck with starting at that. But inventories can use different criteria, different goals, different assumptions, and we might need to be thinking about those. Let's come back to that. Berkeley's program was supposed to be a hybrid, remember, but the phase two is pending. So what makes a regulation reasonable? This is the highfalutin policy analyst in me thinking, and I'll have you bear with me for a slide or two, but um, my first criteria is legitimacy. If I don't know if a program is gonna be cost effective or not, I wanna make sure that it was established through a democratic process where I have the right to stop the policy if I learn that it's doing something I don't want to. And I want everybody who is affected by it to have a legitimate say in its creation or not. I also want there to be a valid assumption chain um, underlying the rationale for the policy and the rationale for what you're asking me to do about it. And I want you to make policies like this only in so much as you have resources to actually execute them such that there's a high likelihood of benefits that you promised me actually being delivered. So if you're gonna make so many of these borderline gray area policies that you can't afford to implement them and they're gonna fall on their face, We've lost the legitimacy argument. Um, Berkeley is borderline on that one, for sure. Procedural fairness is my second criteria, and this again comes out of the criminal justice literature. People, what they started learning in the 70s is that people often care more about how their case was handled than an actual disposition of the case. So sometimes the means matter more to you than the ends, or as much. 
So how decisions are made, are they transparent, do I have a voice, in, can I be heard if I've been wronged, is there a mode for meaningful participation, that kind of stuff matters when you're um, intruding in this terrain. Now the treatment you receive, that it be equitable, that it be predictable based on the circumstances of your case, is also matters. This is about not being capricious. This is about um, um, making things systematized to a level that people's expectations um, that you can re receive equal treatment. And accountability. You want to have adaptability and learning built into the program. So if you don't know today whether this program is going to pay off, but you think it will, you better be able to tell me five years from now what you've learned about what it's doing so that we can reevaluate that choice and make changes, tweak it, and improve. Finally, I do think it's rational to ask people to make some kind of cost-benefit guesses, show me what the best guesses are, and convince me that the benefits in relation to costs are not offensive. So we, we have in our political system the problem of what we call rent-seeking. So someone who's powerful in the political system can try and manipulate a regulation to set themselves up to collect money for their small group at the benefit of a large cost dispersed over a lot of people. And that is a lot of the reason why we pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> why we pay the taxes we do and sometimes aren't happy with the outcomes from the taxes that we pay. So we need to look at that, those kinds of balances. And you might want to look at things like the type of benefits that are involved. For health and human safety, like I was saying at the beginning, we might decide we don't care if a regulation is cost effective. We just don't want people to die that way. We've decided we can afford it. Let's do it. Um, but we might still ask that the number of people be saved be somewhat proportional to the cost. Um, there are some very interesting studies done of environmental regulations and the amount of money spent per life saved. And it ranges from you know $200,000 to $4.8 billion. I put my number somewhere in the middle. Um, cut off a few of those programs at the end, you've got more money to put into the ones that are more cost productive per benefit achieved. Fine. So, this is how I see things stacking up for the four different types of soft story programs and the color shading is meant to sort of represent favorability. So there's nothing quantitative about this. It is how just kind of how it sits. Is it, is it favorable? Are there lots of issues, lots of problems to be worked out or very few? Is there a good matchup on that particular criteria? And mandatory retrofit is looking a little a little dark there. So let me let me read a few of my notes on this so I can be efficient and get to some dis discussion before we wrap up. Um, the advantages of a voluntary program are clearly the low cost and the relative ease of, of treating all cases the same. So you get a lot of equity in that kind of program, but the factors are traded off against a very low chance of resulting in on-the-ground change. So you put some public effort in and you're just very likely to get nothing out of it. A screening program pr places less burden on owners than does a mandatory evaluation program and co can collect some useful data. So Oakland now has a lot of data. But it's a fairly difficult program to run, just about as difficult as a mandatory evaluation program, only one step short, and still has pretty low chances of creating on-the-ground change. Mandatory evaluation can result in real on-the-ground change. Berkeley has proved that. But Berkeley's a pretty exceptional place in a few ways that I think really, of course, we always say that, but in a few ways that really actually matter for the results the law got. A couple things I encountered in my interviews. There was a major property management company that mistook the law for a mandatory retrofit <laughs> ordinance and told their clients that. I would guess that um, about about a fifth of the retrofits came as a result of misinformation about the law. Talk about somebody who lost his job. <laughs> um, 
that and many other reasons why other cities might not get the same results. Um, the credible threat issue. Berkeley had that credible threat. I think that wouldn't be there for some other cities, for instance. Um, the program management is resource intensive and requires long-term commitment and follow through. And the results may be sensitive to economic and social perceptions and thus could vary with the timing of your law and with local housing market conditions. The university here anchors housing here. The values just don't go down. Even though it's a rent controlled city, you've got a constant stream of renters here. And I think it would be fair for owners to say in other cities that they would suffer a, a much greater stigma and, and potential loss of value. Whether that claim is real or not, that argument is there. A mandatory retrofit program would impose the highest burden on owners, so it evokes the highest level of scrutiny in terms of the justification for public involvement and the fairness of procedures used to assess each individual's case. So I'm assuming here that we are talking about a rent-controlled city with a mandatory retrofit ordinance and no adjustments to the pass-through allowed, so they've got no income recouping ability. That's why that distributive outcome box is dark for the mandatory retrofit program. But that could be fixed by having an incentive program or negotiating changes to rent control law that would help that situation. So I think I should wrap up, even though I have a few more things to say. <laughs> I want to make sure that we get a chance for a little more discussion. Um, and let's see how fast forward through these. And that's it. In conclusion, we've got work to do. And thanks to the Berkeley Soft Story Program, I've mentioned a few of all their acronyms here and many other people. We have two new viable program models, the mandatory screening and the mandatory evaluation. Those are both born out of this law. We have lots more information than we had before to analyze and learn from. And we can see more clearly the tasks immediately in front of us that will help this kind of policy move forward. I think that's a major public benefit. And Thanks so much.